What is up? What is up? Oh, quite the day today, quite the day. Uh, thanks everybody is popping in. Um, if you, uh, it's a really neat thing, this here stream yard, because some people are watching on my Facebook, some people are watching on my YouTube, some people are watching on Twitter, and that's just so cool. I'm gonna take comments and questions, and uh, yeah, a lot of people have been saying a lot of nice stuff to me today. Uh, I wanna tell you my story a little bit, things I learned. This is my purple belt, and I'm very proud of it. I have, I have, I'm gonna treat myself to a cold one, and I'm gonna go to bed early. Um, but I'm very proud. I've, um, you know, my coach, Justin, I'm gonna tell you about him. I'm gonna tell you uh, what are the best, uh, we're, we're gonna take questions too. I'm gonna tell you about my coach, what I learned from him. I'm gonna tell you about what I learned from the young guys that I was training with. I'm gonna tell you about the path, uh, the things I'm learning along the way. And uh, yeah, man, I don't know. You don't get these kind of days where like there's a big thing, you know? It's a big thing. Like I'm still a kid who loves martial arts, you know? I'm still a kid who just loves martial arts. And uh, we all have a different path. And when I was training with Justin this week, uh, deep dive, you know, full immersion, I also poured myself one ounce of something and, and we will have that in a little bit. Uh, I would not have a, a drink by myself. However, I'm with a hundred people here. So, and hopefully maybe some others, so we can, I can cheers you. Go to bed early and go back into it tomorrow. Dive back into um, into sort of a week of deep dive martial arts. So one of the very first things my coach was, was talking about this week when we started our week was about how everybody's path is different. Everyone's path is different in martial arts. I, uh, my blue belt is in the bag. I'll show you, it's very old. I'll show you real quick, because I can see it. Wouldn't run if I couldn't. Here, talk to the purple belt. Um, oh shit, I almost knocked something over, but we're good. Um, yeah, this thing's real old, real old, right? Thanks for hanging. More people popped up and they're like, where is that guy? Where'd he go? It's real old and worn. You know, you can see all the little, a little history that's us like you know all the shit's wearing off and stuff you know i've had this thing for 13 years <laughs> maybe 14. my first fight was in 2008 and i received my blue belt in 2007. look how new and fresh this one is so i started um and i started training full immersion i knew that I was training to fight. And I'd kind of grown up doing martial arts and I was doing private Muay Thai cl uh, uh, classes and I did Taekwondo since I was a kid and I was a gymnast and a high diver, and, but I knew I was going to fight. Why was I going to fight? To learn, figure out some things about myself. It was a weird time in my life, a turning point in my life. But also on some level, I knew that I wanted to like do what I do today. And I even like, you know, I'm, I'm 13 years into my five-year plan of commentating in the UFC with Joe and Mike Goldberg. Now, Mike is now in Bellator. Who knows, maybe I'll get to work with Mike. Um, and uh, so 13 years into a five-year plan, but I, that was the goal. But I wanted to fight. I knew there was no way anyone could, could accurately analyze martial arts without fighting. And they can't, I don't care what anyone tells you. Uh, I've been a non-fighter who studied martial arts um, actually, I was a martial artist my whole life, so, so I haven't been a non-martial artist, but, but I've been somebody who's never fought and thought I understood, and then I fought, and I realized, oh my God, I literally knew nothing. All this theory, all of this discussion of um, you know, sporting terms and whatever, irrelevant, not a part of reality. So I started training like crazy, and I trained 11 times a week for about eight or nine weeks, and I got my blue belt in like eight or nine weeks. Very quickly, but I earned it. And I proved that when I fought in some tournaments, which I was able to win a couple of tournaments as a blue belt real early. So I was like, wow, man, this could, this, BJ Penn got a black belt in three years. Oh my, Robin trains like crazy, got a crazy workout. To look, he's getting better, he's, you know? And then 13 years later, here we are. But we all got different paths. This first thing Justin was talking to me about this way. Who did you get your purple belt from? We'll take some questions, but that's that's a good one. So the man's name is Justin Bruckman. When I came up, 2006, 7, 
wanted to, I was coming up to fight. I was an odd character who sung in the rock band and people knew on Canadian television a little bit. Wow, with a crazy bad haircut and much worse than COVID. Um, and uh, that made it better. Um, so I came up and I all admired these guys. I admired the guys who came up because I watched my pre UFC. I knew I watched the UFC, but there was a show called TKO. And that's what I watched. That's what I liked. That's what one day I dreamed of fighting in. And I dreamed of commentating. I never did fight there, but I commentated. And I don't know if it'll come back, but I did a lot of shows commentating with my one of my best friends, John Ramdeen. So I achieved that dream. Uh, but I looked at, at these guys and they were my heroes. They were, to me, that was the Canadian UFC. And it really kind of was. Um, when George St. Pierre went down there, he was the champion in TKO. You know who he uh, was able to defeat to get that? The man that gave me my purple belt, Justin Bruckman. Justin is, uh, Justin's an OG. And these guys, they're, they're different. They're different. And I was chatting just briefly with Charles McCarthy today. Charles got turning side kicked in the body by David Loazzo. Many people have seen that. Um, Justin also fought David Loazzo, defeated him too. Um, and these guys of that era are very different. They didn't, uh, uh, you know, they didn't know what each other knew. You know, <laughs> one thing Justin said today was he was like, yeah, back then people was like, where's your opponent from? Montreal. Ah, it's going to be a good fight. Like that was people's idea of like analyzing, you know, fights or really, it didn't matter how big he was or what school he came from. He's from Montreal, you're from Ontario. It's gonna be a great fight. Like they're a different era. So I really looked up to these guys. Sam Stout sent me a message today. Uh, Lovato, like Lovato Jr., like one of the great jujitsu guys in the world. Chris Cyborg sent me a message. All these people, I, I looked up to them. I, I looked up to Justin. And I wanted these people to accept me. You know, I started 2006, 2007, a guy who wore eye makeup, sung in a rock band and wanted to be accepted in the world of martial arts in his country that he admired. And these guys didn't just right away. They made it as, as again, my coach said today, he said, we made it hard on you. And they did, they did. I mentioned Sam. Sam kicked my body a lot of times to see if I would quit. Mark Hominick dropped me with a liver shot and I did quit that round. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't continue. Chris Hordesky kicked my legs until I couldn't stand up. You know, uh, they and uh, uh, Justin hit me in the liver or like, um, you know, like a spear, a toe spear. Uh, and years ago, uh, these guys, they didn't want to hurt me. Uh, they just they wanted to make sure that I belonged and they wanted to make sure that you earned belonging. And I did. And today I, I received my purple belt from one of them, one that I admire greatly. So I'm very, very thrilled. But your journey is long. You know, whatever path you're taking, whatever you know, whatever you make or buy or sell or create or what a job you do or whatever path you're on or if you're someone's best friend or you're someone's enemy, whatever you are, um, it's a long path and it's winding. There'll be weird setbacks and there'll be weird, weird, you know, challenges. Um, and uh, it'll take a while. And if you don't give up, eventually you'll get there. There are two ways, two primary ways you could fail at your goal. You could quit or you could die before you get there. Doesn't matter what it is. Those are really the only two ways. Now people can say, well, I had to quit because my leg got cut off, but others might have continued that even with their leg cut off. Like you can only quit or die before you get there. And that is true of every goal that you have. It's heavy, but it's true. And I'm just not a quitter. Like I just never have been. You know, I spoke to my friend Ian Daw tonight. Ian Daw was, um, he was, if, for, if you're an OG, he was good friends with Evan Tanner and Ian fought. He was like my buddy and, and my main training partner. We did everything together through my first four or five fights and a few of his. And, uh, you know, I was talking to him today and he was saying, you know, man, I just watched you and like you're a fight network and then that happened. And then you you willed this to happen. And then the UFC canceled your thing and you still, and, you know, he's like, you just won't stop. And it's like, this is what I do. It's. I have a, I, I realize I have a craftsman mindset. Some craftsmen will be able to make you the best house tomorrow. It took me 13 years to build up this house. It's a long way yet. It could take me 20 more if I'm ever going to be a 70 year old black belt. Um, but I'm learning, you know, I'm on a path. I want to learn. I want to get better. The only thing I'm interested, the world is changing every minute of every day. Are you, are you changing? Cause if you were not, the world will change and inherently you will be you will be left behind or the world will change around you shit changes 
shit changes and you have to change the things that got you to this point, wherever you are, things are okay, life is good, life is great, life is challenging, whatever's happening, whatever got you to here will not be what gets you further, gets you to the next point, gets you to the next check-in. It'll be new skills. Gonna have to have, you're going to have to learn new skills. You're going to have to unlearn some things. You're going to have to take things you think you know, and you're going to have to shatter those, those beliefs. This is life, right? Th some things are going to be hard. It took me 13 fucking years to go from this belt to this one. That was a lot of reasons for that. Could I have done it different? If I put that gi on and went, you know, 11 weeks in a row and worked really hard, in 2011, this could have happened, or 2017, at any stage of the point. But I'm a generalist too. I want to learn about life. Martial arts is one of my vehicles to learn about living, to learn about the adventure. This thing represents, you know, all the things that I learn along the path. Um, and I'm learning Muay Thai, and I'm learning editing on a computer. I learned that like a martial art. And I'm learning to analyze things. I'm learning my job on television, I'm learning how Instagram works. I'm learning to, you know, run a YouTube channel and figure out what StreamYard is and how I can stream on three. I don't know any of this shit. I have to learn it all. You know, once upon a time I worked in a television studio. And then on a, on a Wednesday morning, I was visiting my wife in San Diego. She was working. She was traveling for work. And I got a phone call and they said, yeah, we, we killed the whole department. I didn't know how to edit. I didn't know, I didn't have an Instagram. I didn't have a YouTube channel. I didn't have a podcast. I didn't do it. I didn't know how to do any of that stuff. I knew how to analyze martial arts a bit. When I look back, that was four years ago. I laugh at what I thought I knew, uh, but that's good. I hope that I laugh at what I think I know now in four years. I had to learn all of it. And I learned it exactly the same way that I, that I have studied martial arts. Everybody starts at white belt. Literally the first thing I made, if you're watching on YouTube, some people watch on Facebook or Twitter. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, the very first video I made, very first one. And yes, I had, I've had. i always had help. I've had the good fortune to have friends that help me. And sometimes they're important friends. Joe Rogan tweeted my very first YouTube video. Now 36,000 people follow me on YouTube. But then after he did that, it was like 3,000. Like that day, most people will never have something like that in their life. And I'm very grateful. Um, but uh, my very first video was everybody starts a white belt. It was literally now I have, I don't know, a thousand YouTube videos and 35,000 people follow me on there. I made 1700 videos on my Instagram, but then I had none. Didn't know, I didn't know how to do any of that. And I started that white belt. And then I slowly worked my way up. And after a thousand it, one minute breakdowns, I learned to edit. I learned to voice it, I learned to cut it, I learned to post it, I learned what Instagram was, how that shit worked. Why? Because this is what I love to do. And I wasn't going to quit. I wasn't gonna quit. You can either, again, I don't know if you just popped in, seems a hundred people just popped in. If you just pop, and thank you. Thanks for hanging out with me. Uh, I should not drink a beer, even if I'm only having one, I should not drink it alone. So thank you to a couple hundred people hanging out. Very thoughtful. And thank you. People have just been saying the nicest things and, and well wishes from all kinds of people. But, you know, I, like I said, I'm not, I'm very proud to have earned my purple belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but I'm proud to have earned it from a mentor and a leader and a man and a friend and an OG and a badass that I admired when I started with a white belt on uh, But you just every, and that's an, another one of my things I was saying back when I started this channel. Everybody starts at white belt, everybody. I don't care what the thing is you'd like to do or you're interested in doing or you have a dream of doing or as you wanna start an Etsy store or a YouTube channel or you're gonna make bracelets and sell them in a market. I don't give a fuck, you start a white belt. It's really fucking simple in a weird kind of way. The craftsman then starts out they don't know anything and they don't worry about how many followers they'll have, how many sales they'll make, how many subscribers. None of that shit matters, and it will never matter. And the le the less you think about it, the better it will go. Let me tell you, I, I'm jumping all over the place, but I'm delighted, and I'm tired, and I'm, I'm proud, and uh, I feel good. But um, when I first started my YouTube channel, people, you know, 300 people will watch. And I was like, wow, 300 people watch. That's really great. It's going to be a long way till, till it's enough to, to pay my rent. And in fact, YouTube never paid my rent. YouTube ended up being a place where I could just speak to people. 
and share ideas. And that's wonderful. Everything doesn't have to pay you. Uh, some things are it, the inherent value of just doing them is the thing. But I would put a video up and the comments that I would see, and this is a very common thing. Cheers, by the way. Save this just to have with everybody. This is to Justin. It's, it's a great honor to receive my belt from you, sir. Um, I'm gonna go to bed in about 30 minutes, but um, again, thank you everybody for hanging out with me. So people would come on and they would leave comments and they would say, if you want more followers, you should something. Whatever that thing is, don't ever do that. Whatever that thing is. You, if you want more followers, you should you know, react to the matchups. You should make predictions. You should do what people who, and you're in landscaping, you should do what landscaping.com does. No, you should not, right? If you want more followers, you should blank. Don't ever do any of that. Anything that somebody tells you that will you know, give you more short-term, easy, low-hanging fruit success, don't do it. Because the long-term is more important, number one. Number two, if you have 3,000 people who buy your bracelets or hire your company or get haircuts from you or train jujitsu under you or watch your breakdowns, treat them as the most valuable thing in the world. The second you're like, how do I get more people? You know what you're doing? You're fucking like, you're, you're, you're giving the finger to the people that are already behind you. Don't do that. Don't worry about getting more Instagram followers or more subscribers or more, you know, clients in your barber chair. It doesn't matter what you do. Worry about really taking care of the ones you have. And when I was sitting there sharing ideas, weird abstract ideas about martial arts and 3000 people gave a shit and other people are like, you should change this and you'll get more people. I'm like, but what about these 3000? Like, what about these people? These people like this. I do this and people who like it came along and said, we like that. That's how you should do your thing. It might take 15 years until let's say what you do is real weird. Some other people will think it's cool. They'll want to buy it or wear it or whatever it is you do. Don't try to cater to those people. Take the ones you have and let them know that they're your people. If you got 13 people who buy your thing, treat them like gold. Don't forget about them and try to figure out what all these people want. And that's what I did. That's what I did. That's been my journey. So, and part of my journey to today, which is really exciting for me, I also went deep dive into Muay Thai. I traveled to Russia and I studied, before I was going to commentate 18 different martial arts in Russia, I studied Sabbat and sambo and sumo and i studied all of these things and then i commentated you know let way and i commentated full contact wushu which is called sanda and i commentated these things and by doing them all yes it took me 13 years for this one but i see this different now i see this different you know and i'm proud of it my story and it was the very first thing my coach said this week it's like the interesting stories are these ones you know, the interesting stories are these ones. So you didn't, I took a weird path and my path to this stage of understanding jujitsu traveled through sumo and it traveled through, you know, belt wrestling, an ancient form of belt wrestling. And it traveled through Dambe, which is a full contact fist fighting with other weapons from Nigeria. That's between a thousand and 2000 years old, depending on what history you look at. And I studied cave paintings of ancient martial arts and crazy shit because that's my path. And could I do it? You, you might get your purple belt quicker if you did this this way. But doing it a different way is a good thing. It's a great theme we had all, all week long. I watched also Justin, my, my, my professor, uh, I watched him train with six other black belts. And then I watched them share information about the experiences that they had competing with each other, friendly competition, and that was revealing. But uh, a th big theme we had all week is, you know, the right thing, if I'm doing the right thing and he's training, he's trained for me to do the right thing that he can respond to, what if I did the wrong thing? 
if I did the wrong thing? He's not prepared for the wrong thing. He doesn't expect me to do the wrong thing. I'm a purple belt. He's expecting me to do the right thing. Maybe I should do the wrong thing. He, he will not expect that. These are at they're these strong themes and these different ways of understanding. I feel like I've I've hit them by having a weird path. Let's take some questions. What are the best beginner striking combos? The best beginner anything is just begin. And I'm, I'll always say this, and I'm not trying to be facetious or snatch the marbles from my hand bullshit. It's just start. Doesn't matter what to do. Just start, do. All the time, and and uh, Elon Musk the other day, somebody said, what would be three pieces of advice that you'd give to somebody right now? And his answer was like, don't be someone who would ask a question like that. And he wasn't trying to be a dick, and I'm certainly not. Like, I like your question. Um, but any amount of time that you think wondering which combo to do, in all that time, you could have done all of them. Could have tried every single one. You could have just sat there and like, well, what should I do? Should I jab, cross, hook? You could just literally jab, cross, hook, jab, uppercut, step up. You know, you could just do. And a lot of the time, a lot of learning, questions are great. Gathering information is powerful, but doing is also powerful. Um, a lot of congrats, and that's so thoughtful. And people like, you know, a friend of mine posted, he was like, reposted my post and just talked about how happy he was for me. And that's so nice. What felt better, leaving white belt behind and going to blue or getting your purple belt? That's a really cool question. That's a really specific question. And people's questions, some of these are, you know, 15 minutes old. So I'm sorry if you're not here. Um, this feels special to me. That that felt like, you know, I was rolling and like I was I was winning and I was getting so good and I was changing the world and I was changing my world. And it was very vital you know, to go from, and I was only a white belt for literally nine or 10 weeks because I was that guy. And it was exciting to be that guy. It was, ex and there was nothing else in the world. You know, I was in a relationship that wasn't like mine now where I'm married to my best friend and, you know, she, like I'd rather hang out with her than anyone. I know most people don't say that. I know I have a lot of great things in my life. So I'm very grateful, but you know, I was in, I had a job that only was there to pay, to make enough money to pay my minimum bills and then pay for my training. That was it. I worked and there was nothing else in the world. My part, when I met my wife, she was, you know, when she tells it now, she's like, yeah, I went into his apartment and she's like, it looked like a serial killer lived there. <laughs> That's how she tells it. Because I had a futon and a television and like an area and a mat to stretch. And it was like a big apartment. There's fuck all in it and I had food in the fridge. And that's it. Because that's what I did. I, I wanted to train. I wanted to learn. And it was an interesting way to live, you know. So it was very exciting. But this is far more exciting. This This is, it's also like a lot of things are gradual. You know, all of a sudden one day, Sam Stout and Mark Hominick and these guys I looked up to, George St. Pierre, are, are treating me nicely. And then they're really saying nice things about me. And then they're thanking me for things I do in the thing. And I'm like, wow. But this is like, this represents, I'm part of a really small club. Uh, you know, I'm part of a lineage of the first real lineage of, of black belts in Canada now. And he's my friend. You know, my coach is my friend. And, and he's a mentor. And, you know, I, what I love about this guy, many of the, my favorite people are like this. Many of my favorite people, maybe you're like this. I like people who are trying to help other people on their path, but also on an imperfect path of their own. That's me. It's probably you, right? It, you can help people along and be there to help give somebody an answer or give somebody encouragement, even though you don't have all the answers. Those are always my favorite people. Always. And if we let ourselves, that's all of us, right? Like who the fuck has all the answers? Not your jujitsu coach, even if he's a genius and inspiring and whatever. Not that, not, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk or Joe Rogan or whoever the fuck you watch. Like, they don't have all the answers. They may be at a stage of their life where they give a lot of answers, but they got their own shit they're trying to figure out too. That's the truth of life. That's an, and it's something I love about all my favorite people are like that. A uh, lot of nice things. Who'd you get your purple belt from? We did that. As long as you have a deep desire for something, you can get it if you never give up. Yes. And we were saying that. It's like there are two primary ways to fail. Die before you achieve the thing beyond your control. 
know, with, within your control is stay healthy, you know, make sure that you like eat well, sleep, don't like do ex or over extraordinary risk taking behavior, like, cause that could result in you dying. And now that was sort of within your control, but generally speaking, death is kind of outside of your control a lot of the time, uh, but quitting is within your control. You gonna quit? No? Okay, we'll probably keep going then. And then, and then we'll get somewhere. Uh, favorite gi sub, big congrats. I don't know. I mean, when you're wearing a gi, they're all gi subs, right? It's an incredible beauty in a collar choke. Get in behind the neck. I guess it's, we'll try to show it in my neck, get in behind the neck, and then get in behind the other neck, and then tie those two pieces together. And um, my, my very good friend, John Ramdean, and I wish I could call him tonight, but he'll be sleeping all night. Um, and tell him he loves Justin too. A lot of us do. Um, uh, this is this oh, this generation we love, but he kind of represents all of them in some ways. And I say that with with love and respect for for their whole group. Um, but uh, John Ramdean used to talk about when he was a bouncer, and uh, he was a head doorman. And of course, you want to you want to stop danger and protect people when you're a head doorman, but you don't want to hurt somebody as if at all possible. One, it's bad to hurt people. We don't want, we don't want to cause injury unnecessarily. Some drunk idiot, now we broke his, something. It's also, you can be charged with something. Now it'll negatively, negatively affect you and your family. Uh, so we won't, don't want to do that. And he was like, you know, in the winter time, when there was some guy acting like a crazy idiot, you just call and choke him for this, with this parka. And that's the cool thing about gi jiu-jitsu. It's like, in Canada, at least, we're all wearing a jacket. You know, in the summer, it's different. But you're basically wearing one, right? So it makes sense. Oh, and I was talking about Ram Dean. Congratulations, you still talk to John Ram Dean. I really miss the work you guys used to do together. So the idea of two friends bouncing back and forth, doing like doing a show, a daily show, there are people doing it right now that are basically now hitting kind of the vibe that we had. And it's, it's tough, I miss them, I do, I really do. Do you see you have thousands of young men who are interested in fighting that trust you and your morals and would follow your commands? Okay, first of all, commands is a little heavy. I ain't given no commands, uh, but it's a, kind, it's a kind sentiment for sure. Uh, and a freaky sentiment. Like, I'm a martial arts fan. I'm a kid. I'm a nerdy kid who can't believe that he gets to do what he loves to do all the time. So the idea that people look up, you know, take my perspective and see a lot of value in it is heavy. It's thrilling. Um, people are texting me. Uh, uh, I like me some Rogan and Gary, LOL. Yeah, I mean... So Joe Rogan has been one of the most influential by far to me. He's helped my career a great deal. And so is Gary, to be honest. Gary, when I first, so I was telling you at first, lot, you know, my job disappeared at the television network I worked at. And I was like, how do I do YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and all this kind of stuff? And how do I figure out how I can still be a martial arts analyst in that? And Gary had somewhere along the line, I'd met him through emails and he emailed and he linked in a whole bunch of, he responded to me through something somewhere and he linked in a whole bunch of people at Vayner Media. And then they reached out, Leslie and a couple of other people reached out to me and they gave me like, when I started, literally the day of my first YouTube channel, they gave me like an hour on a, my, on a uh, uh, box, on a speakerphone or whatever we called it back then, four years, five years ago, in a room with five or six of them and they just like, I asked questions and they gave me answers. And it's really cool. And uh, yeah, so I've, I've met Gary a couple of times and he's been, he really helped me a lot. Joe Rogan is martial arts expert. Gary Vaynerchuk is a digital expert and they've been two of my like mentors and two people have really helped me. So I'm super lucky and I don't, I will never take shit like that for granted, trust me. Hello from, from uh, Halifax, big fan of mentality of combat sports. So if you don't follow me on YouTube and you're watching this somewhere else, because there are many different places this is stream, three different places this is streaming. I do a podcast called The Mentality of Combat Sports with my friend David Mullins, who is a sports psychology consultant. And uh, yeah, and but thank you for saying that. Someone tell Robin you can't do jujitsu against an invading army of United Nations police. Robin is more than a purple belt. He is George Washington of our time, if only he would accept it. Okay, what is your name? Eben Rude. Heavy. 
Uh, but thank you for the uh, for the for the kind sentiments. No, you are the George. Okay, if you are um, very under the influence of alcohol or drugs, I like where you're going. I appreciate you. Um, how long have you been doing martial arts? When I was like nine ish, I started doing taekwondo. So that was in the seventies. I'm over fifty now. Uh, so I've been doing martial arts my whole life. Um, and, uh, I was really good at Taekwondo and I was, uh, you know, I won a lot of tournaments. I, I enjoyed competing. I had a full contact fight in a bar in Selkirk, Manitoba when I was 17 against like a 27 year old man who trained in a martial art called Sikaran. Sikaran is a Filipino martial art, uh, that was evolved by a man named Dante. I, his last name is escaping me, but it, it essentially came from the Philippines to Winnipeg and they had a whole crew of these sort of kicking martial artists. And I had a full contact punches and kicks fight with this guy in a, uh, in a bar in Selkirk when I was 17. It's a wild one. I wish, you know, I wish I had more information or footage or something because it was really, but yeah, I've been doing martial arts my whole life, but we all travel at different speeds. And, you know, I'm very much a martial arts generalist. I love jujitsu. I love karate. I love taekwondo. I love the art of wrestling and boxing, but my passion is free fighting. What can my human body do? And what can yours do when we are in conflict and all is possible? And uh, so I, I love the individual arts and I'm honored to be able to train them. And it's just such a joy when I get to take, you know, be accept knowledge from somebody uh, in uh, a specialty. Um, but I'm a generalist. I've, I study them all and I, and I, and right now I'm passionately into the philosophies of understanding what's really happening. If we don't call it jujitsu or we don't call it an arm bar, or we don't even call it a jab, what are the bodies doing? What are the minds doing? What's actually happening when we remove the language, language of sport, language of art, language of martial arts, if we remove the language, what's actually happening. If I call this a jab, in English, and I talk to someone in China, they don't have a translation for jab. They just have a different word for this. They're not, those jab and that word aren't the same. It's, it, it is each of our interpretation of the movement, the expression. And I'm really into this trip right now. Big hello from Warsaw, Poland. Congrats for the belt. Thank you, my friend. Um, thank you very much. Warsaw, Poland. Wow. Um, I love KSW. And I've done bits and pieces for them, and I hope to do more analysis for them in the future. You can think I'm crazy, but I've never ever thought of someone like that before. Robin has something special and could literally change the world, in my opinion. That's very kind, man. Um, I really think we all can. I think we can all influence the world around us. I truly believe that. I truly do. Um, uh, oh, man, I want to go to Warsaw again. Congrats. Thank you. Boss, right back at you. Uh, man, a lot of people saying that. Um, you're one of the best analysts and truly inspiring. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I don't think I do the same thing as the people who are analysts at a desk on a TV show. I do that job. But to me, I analyze martial arts and sometimes I do it on television. I think a lot of these people uh, see the role of television analyst as the thing. And I know it's a small discrepancy, but I live to analyze martial arts. And sometimes I find a way to get paid to do it on television. Sometimes I do it on television for free or in any type of environment, sometimes to pay my bills and sometimes out of fun or adventure. Um, but a lot of people think this is a role. The role of the television analyst will be to stand a particular way and speak a particular way and say certain things. I don't buy that. I, that's not my jam. Uh, that's not what I do. Uh, and that's not what I'm going to do. Um, and that's okay. Everyone's different. Congrats on the purple belt. I knew you were legit, but you did MMA. Uh, and that makes you super legit as fuck. <laughs> super legit as fuck is a nice cop sentiment. So this is my belt. This was a Canadian title that I won. I had nine professional MMA fights. What, so when I got this, the old one, the old beat up one, it's all faded and stuff. Um, I competed in, in blue belt in, in jujitsu as a way to prepare for some of the intensity of fighting. 
it doesn't it doesn't do enough, but it does something. You know, it's intense. You feel the pressure, the, the violence. There is violence, but you're not getting punched and kicked in the face or the legs or, you know, your liver is not like it's it's different, uh, and it's not it's not a you know you're not sixty percent there, you're not twenty percent there, but it's something. And so I I competed and I did really well. I um, you know. It's a trip down memory lane for me today, but I got bronze in the Pan Ams as a senior uh, or masters, which is not being a master, it's age, uh, blue belt. And I won Naga Worlds in inter, uh, intermediate masters or senior. And so I competed a lot as a, as a blue belt. And then when I started fighting MMA, to me, it was free fighting. And although my wins were almost all by submission, and I did, you know, no gi grappling and even getting th these last four or five days, the deep immersion, I just felt so much better today. The first day I was like, oh my God, I can't remember how to shrimp my hips. And it was really, you know, cause it's, I haven't worn a gi in a year and I haven't been able to grapple with a human, you know? And uh, so it was, it was a little demanding and it was a little embarrassing and it was good for my ego, you know? Uh, but then today I felt a lot better, but nothing like I did when I was, you know, fighting, but that's okay. We're at different stages. You know, I may never feel like that again. I may never, I, I'm scared I may never be that good of an athlete again. I'm in my 50s, you know? I'm, that's old, right? that's pretty old. You know, you can be super fit and lift heavy weights and be a pretty good athlete at 60 today. Now, if you had lots of steroids and shit that like Stallone has, uh, 70s, <laughs> but I don't think I'm gonna go down that road. I think I'm gonna try to eat well and get a lot of sleep and whatever. Uh, and and stretch and exercise, you know. Please cover the Galval Gordon slap. Would love to hear your thoughts. Well, you will be happy to hear. If you go back, go to my Instagram at Robin Black Martial Arts and go back about five or six posts, seven max. You will see my breakdown of the slap, and then after that, I post something about uh, about Gordon. Oh. I think Gordon Ryan's brilliant, and again, my coach, who I think you know, he's he's a as high a level of a mind and a, you know, a, even still in his forties with spinal surgeries and fusions and stuff, still as good a fighter as there is. And he's like, Gordon Ryan's on another level. You know, it, it wasn't even a, wasn't even something he meandered around. Like it's, that's real. That's that you're, you're watching a Michael Jordan, whether people understand that or not, you're watching a Wayne Gretzky. Like that's where he is. There will be others who come as that gets elevated there will be others like that, but Gordon Ryan is a whole fucking other thing. And the next guy under him, we don't even know if he's, you know, if Gordon Ryan is a hundred, we don't know if anyone's a 58. We don't know. There's people who say, oh, he's bigger. And you know, there's, there, there's debate, but for a lot of us uh, that analyze these kinds of things, you know, I'm, I'm not qualified to fully analyze a black belt, but I've been studying uh, uh, jujitsu for 14 years and and uh, the stage I'm at as a mover is maybe different than uh, as one who analyzes it. But I also realize, and I say this all the time, this is the truth. When I'm talking about how calling yourself a martial arts analyst when you don't do martial arts is crazy, I say this and I mean it. I'm trying to analyze Israel Adesanya versus Jan Blachowicz. And I only have nine professional fights. It's so, my knowledge is so limited because I only have nine fights. Imagine if I had no fucking fights. Like I'm starting to understand how a lifetime of study doesn't give me enough knowledge to accurately analyze this. And yet, Somebody who doesn't study, people who don't study martial arts are like, well, you know, you just got to put a little more volume on them. And, you know, if he steps out in this angle and like, you know, distance management, like, I don't know. I, I, I can't speak for them. I don't get, you know, I, I can't tell them what to do, but clearly it doesn't make sense. I can, I can advise you that you should question if that makes sense. If somebody has dedicated their life to martial arts and what that revealed is you don't know enough to accurately analyze what if you knew nothing? What if you'd never done martial arts? You know, so, but that's up to people. My man, Robin Black, cheers from France. We met at, okay, this will be cool. We met at the open workouts of Bellator New York City. I came straight to you, congrats. Please don't forget the 
Abadi Botha analysis. Oh yeah, I've got that actually. So yes, I appreciate you, Renaud. Renaud, is that how you say it? So Francois Botha was a boxer turned kickboxer. And of course, an elite, and really early in the blending. Imagine if Canelo, and Botha wasn't Canelo, but he, you know, I'm using that as an extreme example. Imagine if Canelo said, I'll take some kickboxing fights. Yeah, you could teach Canelo to kick. It's not like saying if Canelo said, I'll fight MMA, because it's going to take a long time to understand all of those things. But if Canelo kickboxed, they'd be like, well, we better teach you to be able to catch kicks maybe throw a few kicks, but when you get in there, you're going to light these fuckers up with your hands. <laughs> and Botha was super, and Botha was not Canelo, but he was super early on this kind of connection from a high level, you know, t I believe top 10 uh, boxing heavyweight or very, you know, right into that range uh, into kickboxing. And he was a badass. And so anyways, the I will end up with like many, many videos. And you want to see like, Watch this. This is how many videos I'm either editing or building or fighting or, or like analyzing. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. But somewhere in here, step one is capture the video and begin to kind of take it in and, and look at it and play around with it and get to know it and build a relationship to those moments. That's the thing. You don't know, like, well, it's X here to Y here. Like that's not, I, I develop a relationship to the moments. Um, and somewhere in here, I have bo uh, Botha, that, that uh, Botha being knocked out with that head kick. So I have it. it. I just have to find the time to do it. I've got about 50 that, uh, that I'm behind on. Um, but uh, Mr. Warren, so we talked about this briefly. Who are some of your favorite analysts? My take, and I don't think I'm better than anybody, but I think for the most part, television MMA analyst is a role. It's a formula. It's a structure. Hey, talk about these seven things. Do it in this way. Use this kind of enthusiasm. Do it this like this. I feel like it's so structured that it interferes with the brilliance of the martial artists who do it. I, I haven't had a chance to, to just sit and watch some of Dan Hardy's YouTube analysis because I'm just working all the time. But I know it's probably way fucking better than the stuff he gets to do when he's doing a UFC broadcast. The, the sports analysts, the, the, the television sports analysts, I don't like any of it because it is all very formulaic. Uh, but some of the people who I like, who I think are brilliant martial artists, able to express it, like Dan Hardy is one of the ones that I love and really love his work. I just love the way he thinks as a martial artist. So if I get to sit and listen to Dan on a two hour podcast, I'll be like, this guy's a brilliant martial artist. Who's a good analyst? Analyst to me is starting to be a bad word. It's starting to be a fucking television corporate gig. And I don't like television corporate gigs. You know, who's the best NFL analyst? Well, some football player who talks in sports cliches. That's where the UFC analyst is getting. Who are the best martial artists able to express cool ideas? Guys like Dan, Dominic Cruz. Like there are great, really. If you didn't fight though, I'm not interested in hearing you talk about fighters. I'm interested in hearing you interview people. I'm interested in hearing you talk about the news. I'm interested in hearing you talk about rankings and things, but I'm not interested in hearing you if you never did martial, and never mind fought. There are coaches who only fought once or had a couple of sparring sessions or whatever, but they're lifelong coaches, uh, brilliant coaches, and they never fought. Uh, but you know, they lived in a gym for the last 40 years of their life. Cool. I, I will learn from them and I've learned from many of them and I always will. Uh, but you never stepped onto a martial arts mat. You want to tell me about fights? I'm not interested. It's not real. You can play the role because what you, information comes from experience and then is you live it and you feel it and you interpret it and then find the language to share. it. If you do not have the direct connection to the experience, you are now taking other people's experience that they've talked about, but they're not talk they're talking in words that are limited by the par like the paradigm and the parameters of television. So if you learn what you learn from hearing even the very best, you know, Dan Hardy, Joe Rogan, whatever, uh, talk about at like commentate, you're not learning the truth. 
because they only have 10 seconds or they only have like camera one or like, you know, they have producers who tell them to do it a certain way. They can't tell you the truth. They can only tell you a television truth, which is not a truth. If you learn from that, you think that's true. I'm not interested, you know, like, but there was once a man named Notorious, clean image with a career truly glorious while sipping his whiskey, his antics grew risky and now his movements are laborious. I never heard that before. I don't know if you wrote it, but I dig it. Love hearing your perspectives on all topics. Thanks. What a kind thing to say. Wow. Thank you. Oh, you, I'd love to a slap breakdown. Maybe show Gordon Ryan and compare it to the Diaz brothers or the Russian slap competitions. There's a Polish slap fighting happening in two weeks, and I reached out to somebody and said, "Hey, can I commentate this? I'll do it for." And I, I don't like to say I'll do it for free. My wife's always like, why would you do it for free? Like, you're a professional. People love your work. Why would you do it? I just want to do it. <laughs> so I end up, I get paid well for a lot of my work. But for things I really like, I end up doing it either for free or for just crazy cheap because I just want to do it. Uh, so someone will see this video and say, oh, Robin Black will do your slap fighting for free. But I really want to commentate one of those. <laughs> There's a lot going on there. A lot different in age. Oh my God, he's unconscious. There's a lot of physics. There's a lot of biology. There's a lot of really, really like meaningful stuff going. I'd love to do it. Who do you lean towards? Is he or Jan? No idea. I never do know. Uh, hey, Robin, can you speak on being disciplined about writing, working towards a paper in Canadian Arctic geoscience coming out later this month? Can you talk on discipline during the deep work? Dude, Frank. When was that? 11.40, so 10 minutes ago. Frank, I hope you're still here. So that's super cool. Uh, you wrapped it with during the deep work. Have you ever read deep work? I recommend everybody right now, no matter what you're doing, if you're watching this on your phone, wherever you are, take a note, Deep Work by Cal Newport. If you read that book, you'll have the answer to this and the answer to many things. You know, scarcity is in, has inherent value. In a world where everybody's doing shit super quick and just like doing it fast and, and doing it in mass, taking time to do deep, introspective, high-end work is valuable. So figuring out how to do the deep work is important. But Frank, one thing I will tell you, you probably know this, you're a writer. And if, ah, I was gonna say if you don't, but you do. You've seen this, you've heard this, you don't need it from me. Get up in the morning and write a page and do it no matter what. And uh, if you if you can, then later in the day, write another page. But that's what you do. And you do it every day. It's a, it's a craftsman's mindset. Craftsman's mindset. Um, I'm at thousands of breakdowns now. Um, thousands. Uh, and I wasn't paid anything for probably, well, I was paid when I when I did the first few hundred at Fight Network, but I had a whole team and we were all paid and we made content. The world changed. And I was like, I still want to do this. I'll just make one. It takes me three days to make it, so I'll make two a week. You get better. It takes me two days to make this, so I'll make three a week. You get better. I think I can make one of these a day. Once I started making one of these a day, at the end of the month, I'd have 27 or 29 or 31, whatever. Third, you make 30 of something and you get fucking good at it. You get up, every, I got up every morning and I made a breakdown. I got up every morning, I took some video I liked and I analyzed it. I tried not to do it the same all the time. Even uh, I, the, the words do a breakdown, I don't like that anymore. And I analyzed something and created something from it. Uh, breakdown sounds like it's a formula or a structure or a way something has to be done. It's not my thing, it's not my jam. I don't wanna execute against your formulas. I wanna innovate. Uh, but you get up every day and you write. You get up every day and you create. You get up every day and you shoot. Whatever it is, you fucking do it. And you balls up and you fucking do it. And uh, I make a really nice living now. And I'm pretty successful. People seem to like my shit. Uh, they don't like it because I'm a fucking genius. I'm not. I'm just some dork in Canada uh, who didn't wouldn't quit and did it all all the time over and over and over again until he got better, until he found new questions and pursued them until he found new answers. And if you, I don't care who you are, you know, we're now at, uh, it was 1700 until I got paid. We're, all, we're closing in on 3000 breakdowns. I don't care who you are. If you do 3000 of something, you will improve. 
if you don't die before you get there and you don't quit, you're going to keep improving. It's really kind of simple. I, I've heard it, and it was actually Cal Newport where I heard it from. He's a great writer. Uh, the craftsman's mindset. You take that mindset. You're like, what if in two years somebody paid me to do this, but I love doing it? Will I do it every day because I love doing it? And there's inherent joy from doing it. And, and uh, you know, you do it at, for its own value, but you also do it because by doing it, you get better. And as you get better, you enjoy it more. And as you enjoy it more, you do it more. And as you do it more, you get better. And eventually one day you're fucking, you know, making doctor or lawyer money doing shit you love. You know, working, you're still working just as hard as a doctor or a lawyer, but you're making bracelets or you're painting shit purple or you're analyzing martial arts or whatever you do. You know, if somebody said in three years, you could make, and uh, the money doesn't matter. You have to deprioritize money even when you have none, especially when you have none. But if somebody said, you, oh, you love, you know, playing video games, you love making art on your phone. What if you can make $100,000 or $150,000 or $800,000 or $40,000 or whatever? What if you could pay your bills in three years if you worked at it for free for three years? I don't know if I should work at it for free. Do you love it? I do love it. Then fucking do it. Do it. You love it? Do it. You don't need to be paid to do shit you love. You love it. So do it. If you do it, you'll get better at it. If you get better at it, people will like it. More people like it, you'll do more of it. You get better. It's simple. It's not easy. It's simple. It's not easy. Uh, you look 42. I'll take that. That's that's the best. If I heard that when I was 22, I'd be real mad. Uh, but right now, that's the nicest fucking thing that, that you could say to me. What a kind thing. Wait, I lost. Oh, no. Do we have that many comments? I mean, not, not oh, no. Uh, wow, 50s. You look 39. Holy shit. I just got three years younger. Good job, man. It takes a lot of work to get a purple belt. Something you will carry with you for life. It's true. I have achieved this thing. And that is for life. I'm a purple belt. I'm a second degree black belt in Taekwondo. I'm a, I'm a retired professional mixed martial arts fighter. This is my Canadian title that I weren't won. I earned. People will dispute whether or not, you know, it was actually a Canadian belt or what it meant. Shows create their own titles. But I, I fucking won that. And I'm a purple belt in jiu-jitsu today, and I'm very proud. I feel really good. Do you think Joe Lozon will come back? I don't. Uh, but I don't know. Um, love how honest you are. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I actually have a theory on that. Whatever you think now, I mean, there are people who committed crimes and probably should admit it, but uh, like if you're just a regular person and we're talking about your fears or your anxieties or your thoughts, about being honest, uh, just be honest. Because again, scarcity has value. In a world where everybody thinks lying is better, they're all doing it. So in a world of lies, somebody telling the truth is really scarce and weird and cool. So uh, tell the truth, you know? Oh, my friend uh, just sent, my friend Jeff just sent like, you know, purple. That's so cool. Uh, Oh, Walter, somebody said Walter Gretzky died. Oh, that's harsh, man. Yeah. My, you know, all our fathers, if those of us who have them, all our fathers and mothers and will die one day and will die one day. And it's scary. Man, like, um, forget that. Uh, it's scary. But um, uh, it will happen. And um, my, you know, it, I'm not trying to connect my dog to people's family, but I'll, I'll, you'll, you'll make sense of it when I get there, I hope. Um, my dog is 15, so he'll die in the next couple of years. Could be in three weeks, like, I don't know. So when I, when I sit with him, I think, you know, I'm going to Toronto, going to Victoria, maybe this will be the last time I see him. And I really, it, it gives me like a real honest connection. And I've started doing that with my wife. My wife's only 33. Um, I'm 50. Um, she shouldn't, she's healthy and beautiful and young. And But uh, I started just doing that. So although I'm doing that with him because that's coming, I do it with her because it's coming. She, hopefully she'll live for 60 years. But why wait to feel that way 
or like connect that deeply or like be that present, why wait 59 years for that? Why wait 58 years? I can do that right now, you know? And we can all do that. We can all do that. You can literally, and it sounds morbid, but it isn't. You can, you can see your, like my, you know, you can see your mother or your father or your best friend or whatever. And you can think they're going to die. If they died tomorrow, how would I be with them right now? And you can do that. I do it sometimes. I can't do it all the time. Uh, some people can live like that. They can live with that feeling uh, because it helps them be so much more present and the, the moments being more, so much more meaningful. But you can do it. And when you do it, you great things come from it. It's not morbid. It's true. You know, you're like, my, my mother will pass away. Well, hopefully that's in 50 years. But 50 years is not that long. Treat this moment special. You know, um, yeah. So I'm getting off topic and it's time for me to go to bed. Um, where are we here? Also, doing work writing while 12 pack in. <laughs> yeah, come, uh, comment about performance enhancers. Yeah, you know, not, some people write um, when they're, you know, I, literally, I had one drink of alcohol and I'm halfway done a beer, but I'm exhausted. I wouldn't, I won't do my best work right now. And I know I'm chatting and that's, but this doesn't work to me, you know? For some people, their YouTube channel is their work uh, or their, you know, Facebook live stream. For me, this is a chance to chat with people and to hang out and to share in a world where we're all kind of trapped at home. Um, so for me, it's not work, but for some people it is. Um, but yeah, I won't do my best work, even half a beer in. I just won't. Um, Dominic Cruz is gold as an analyst. Again, I think Dominic Cruz is gold as a martial artist. When you talk to him about martial arts, I think it's brilliant. You'll get unlimited insight. But when you force him to be in a cookie cutter role, uh, you won't. I think I don't like that role. I'll play it. And even when I do, and I'm so lucky. TSN, where I work here in Canada, and the stuff I do for Bellator, they encourage me to just experiment. But there will be certain times where a producer, and right now, I don't have any specific role with any of the Bellator broadcasts, but one day I will. You know, I love working for Bellator, and I do good work, and and I'll be there, and somebody will be like, hey, this guy fucking does something that other people can't do. Let's, let's use him in the broadcast. That's just going to happen sometime. Um. That's why I'm not in a rush of bugging anyone for it or like, you know, sending out emails to all the, like the senior producers. I do cool work for Bellator digitally. It, it, logically, people like it and it grows. Eventually, people will be like, we should use that in the broadcast. Now other people imitate your shit and can knock it off and whatever. Um, you could take a guy who isn't a martial artist. He can say shit like me and it might work, you know, so uh, and that can happen. But um, But for me, it's like. I don't have to beg my way into that, but I will at different times I do that. And then PSN, I do certain sports center stuff. And I'm lucky people just like, hey, you're different. Like, go be different, you know? Uh, I've had bits and bits uh, and pieces of uh, work at the UFC. And when I was there, they didn't do that. They were the opposite. They're like, we need you to be this way. Kind of be more like this. Like, sort of like that kind of, you know, Paul Felder sort of, you know, I'm a I'm a fighter, but now I'm a broadcaster and I have a particular voice and I say certain things in kind of a certain rhythm. That's what they want you to be. And that's fine, but it's, that's not what I do. Uh, and that's not what I'm going to do. And I'm lucky. I kind of I kind of fought with that sort of friction of it where it's like, should I do that? And I fought my way through. It's like, no, stick to what you do. Do it different. Do it. Like, trust your instincts. Follow your path. Your path doesn't have to go through talking exactly how everyone talks and thinking how everyone thinks using the same verbiage and you don't have to do that uh and i'm lucky i'm it turned out to be true is bellator still on the zone no bellator's on showtime not a fan of anik he's too corporate i love john anik i hate to be also bear in mind you're like i love dominic cruz but i don't like john anik dominic cruz only works if he has a john anik you need like the i'm the best partner I could ever have in the whole world would be John Anik, other than John Ramdean, who was my longtime partner. But John Anik would be the best partner I could ever have because all of his like very organized thinking and very like like high end broadcasting would allow me to color outside the lines. It'd be the best partner I could ever have. 
I love his work. And I love his work as someone who does the other end of the work. I recognize how good he is at making a Dominic Cruz or a Joe Rogan look good. It's a very specific job. It's a very different job. You are contradicting yourself. That's very important. It is extremely important to contradict yourself. It's really important to keep conflicted, contradictory ideas in your brain. Super important. This is good and this is good. Wait, they're not the same. Always like, don't do this, but I just did this. It's really important, really important. It allows you to stop being like, wait a second, Trump's great, Trump's terrible. This guy's God, this guy's the devil. That thinking is not going to ha- get anyone anywhere. You know, like, I hate the libtards. The, uh, the uh, Republicans are, like, ruining America. Like, this shit is not good. You should be able to see MSNBC and see a little, that makes a bit of sense, and Fox, and that makes a bit of sense. You should be able to blend them. You have to contradict yourself. You have to be able to keep differing ideas in your mind at the same time, ones that don't fit. That's important, super important. Have you seen any of Aaron? He's an old school Renzo and Danaher black belt. No, no, I haven't. Is it possible to teach somebody something that you have not experienced? No. It's possible to not experience something, then hear what someone who did experience said about it and learn something from that but they're using words to explain something that doesn't use words. And all you're hearing is the words, you're not getting the experience. It's just, it's not, it's not. There are things you can't experience, you know, shit that's happening on Jupiter, we can't experience that. If we could, if I could and you couldn't, and we both studied the same shit, I would know a lot more about Jupiter. However, we both can't, so that's all we got, right? You're 100% right about analysts. No, I'm not. I'm not 100% right about anything. Nobody is. Um, but that structure is not real. It's, a, it's, it's the language of sports broadcasting, and it's getting to be an old language. It's getting to be a, a bit of a tired language. What led to the end of your amazing show at Fight Network? It's a good question. Um, in retrospect, the world was changing. Television and cable was disappearing and digital was growing. And they literally fought that change. You, you don't fight technological change. You accept it and you figure out, okay, this is growing. How do we cut costs and keep this growing? They were like, well, this makes no money. And we're, we need to make TV like uh, focus on this. So cut that. Like it just, people, the times passed the, the executive spy. And they made strategy. They made choices that, in retrospect, don't make a lot of sense. And that's a, that is a personal opinion. That is not a that is not a official statement from me or anybody else. That is from my experience. I would simply say, if I had to try to explain this in a court of law, I would say, whatever this cost to create what we had then, um, people, most big companies now would pay three, four, five, ten 10 times that cost to recreate it today. They had it. All they had to do was keep paying that cost, not 10 times it, just that, and grow it. It was already big. They chose not to, but some, some you know, any organization is simply people, and people are fallible. Humans are flawed. They only can work with the knowledge that they can acquire. So if you're missing knowledge, if you can't project, you know, where things are going you, because too much shit is going on, your, your home is under construction or you're having twins or whatever's going on, you're, it's difficult to gather enough information to make logical choices based on where, you know, the business will go. That's true for all of us. It'll happen to me. I hope to have a child. My wife is, as I said, 33 years old, so I could still have a child if I do. I'm going to slip with my ability to assess what's happening in the world. You know, this happens. It's just life. It's nobody's fault. I'll watch that Polish slap event. <laughs> Me too. Uh, do you still do any work with John Ramdean? He's come up a few times today. I love John Ramdean. I, I wish I could have reached him today and tell him about my purple belt. Um, wow, a lot of questions. Sensei Seth, 
What would you say your favorite moment of your career is? I don't know. No, I don't. I don't have one. Today's a pretty great day, but I don't have a favorite. There's cool things. When Conor McGregor like told me how he was going to knock out Jose Aldo and shit like that. Like, there's been some wild things. Um, I think like in the cage fighting though. I mean, when I got this belt, that was pretty cool. Uh, I choked that guy unconscious, you know. Um, fighting probably was the best. At first I was like, I can't, I can't say what my favorite moment is, but my favorite moments were, were fighting. You know, that's something very special, something very, very special. And I'll never get it back in, in my 50s. I still, I, I, when, when lockdown first happened and I was running every day and doing Muay Thai every day, like within like three weeks, I texted Rich Chow, the matchmaker belter. I'm like, bro, I'm thinking I could, I could take a fight. Like I'm getting crazy shape, real excited about it. Like, you know, and he's like, let's go, exclamation point. What he really meant was, I'd need you here to say this for many months, and then I'd need to really realize you're serious, and then I'd need to hear for some, from some doctors, then I'd need to get an insight, and then I'd need to sit down and talk to you, then I'd, there'd be a lot of things. Let's go, it's just like, yeah. What would really have to, but truthfully, I'm, I'm past that, I guess. Um, thoughts on UFC fights this weekend? They are fights, and they're gonna be great. Uh, congrats, thank you, man. Love you, man, keep rocking, you're, you're punk genius take that very true robin thanks for your reply you say it's simple but not easy as long as you don't die how do you balance hard work and rest why do long days on the grind provide better results but risk burning out these are not answers that are simple man if they were we'd all like you know we'd all be winners we just got to figure it out we got to figure out how to balance it out i'm going to grind i'm going to rest you know that's actually another book so deep work by cal newport and then there's another one, it's not here. It's called The One Thing, O-N-E. That's a good one. It tells you how to focus on things. Check out The Egg by High Diaz when you get a chance. You'll love it. Short read. Cool, I will. I notice people who tell the truth are always considered rude or not kind. Not always, but it happens. Uh, you know, it's funny. I've been watching your breakdowns for years, but I've never heard your music. I'll have to do that. You're not missing anything. The band was pretty good, but I'm not. I wasn't a very talented singer. He's a good performer, though. I, I, I could really, like, throw the party, you know? Jan is very cerebral, meat and potato style, not emotional. Does Izzy win if Jan doesn't charge like Whitaker? I mean, here's the thing. Nothing is as cut and dry as we make it. Izzy is very, Jan is very cerebral. No, we'll just make him not cerebral. Meat and potato style. Not emotional. Sometimes he is emotional. Like these things, these very concise statements, uh, you know, they make sense to us. They help us categorize things, but they're not true. Jan's a human. Jan can get, you know, confused, upset, you know, like he can. All those things can happen. Uh, we could literally, <laughs> yeah. So people pop onto other people's things and just send bad vibes. Some people do that. It makes me sad that for them, but what happened to Brian Stan? Brian Stan actually was like, I'm, I don't think he enjoyed it. I think it was too repetitive for him. I, and if I asked him, I haven't, but I'm gonna, I, I have Brian's thing. I'm gonna reach out to him and make a point. I'm gonna send myself a point to do it because I wanna know if the formulaic nature of it was what, you know, it started to feel like him, hey, if I just do this for 10 years, what's gonna, what's it gonna matter? Um, you know, so, that seemed to be the vibe he was creating. And I feel like partly that was, you know, the repetitive nature of it. Hey, it's my MMA hall friends. How you doing, Mr. Black? I'm doing good. Got my purple belt today. Pretty exciting for an old guy on a, on a long trip, you know? Uh, just tuned in. Has anyone asked about your worst BJJ injury? Um, no. Oh, start. Um, separated like where the rib meets the sternum i had something fuck up there also like something where like the rib and the spine or a stabilizer like a little mini stabilizer in the spine i've had a couple um the worst like fighting injury my last fight my uh my fascia my uh, plantar's fascia um 
was like so inflamed I couldn't stand for like three or four days. And I got on a plane and I went on vacation to Mexico, which was planned. And uh, I just couldn't even stand. It was brutal. Yeah, I know. This is what I was saying. So you're, Mr. Orange says what an asshole. But uh, And I, I feel you. I do. But think about it. And go, go a step further. Could you imagine jumping onto someone's live stream just to insult them? So you go to what, a, what an asshole, no judgment. But if you stop just at the first part, you say, well, who would do that? The answer is someone in pain. Someone like having a tough time. Someone whose shit's not going good for it. Someone who's angry, frightened, you know, upset, agitated, stressed out, you know? Like that's who would do that. Yeah, they're an asshole. Um, but you know, they're an asshole because of what they experience. I'm always looking to cut everyone else a break, but hold myself to a higher standard. When I'm an asshole, I'm an asshole. There's no excuse. But when someone else is an asshole, I know there's a reason. And it's true. There's a reason when I am too, but I want to hold myself to a higher standard. Um, thanks for the advice. When I tweet about getting my son into BJJ, but it turned out it wasn't for him. My youngest is enjoying Muay Thai. Yeah. My time. Both are great. Uh, guys, oh my. We've been, I thought it was one o'clock for a second, but it's been an hour. We've been doing this an hour and 10 minutes. Uh, let me wrap by just thanking my, my coach again. It was an honor. You know, it's an honor. I'm like, I'm proud of being a purple belt, but I'm proud of being a purple belt under this, this man, uh, Justin Bruckman. Bruckman with two N's. You can find him on Bruckman's Martial Arts or Bruckman's MMA. You can find him all over. He's on a cool path, and you'll learn a lot if you follow him. And uh, I'm going to go to bed. But um, I got a lot of well wishes and a lot of, a lot of you know, cool thoughts and cool things from people. And uh, it's been a really good day. I'm really thankful. And uh, I think that's it. Enjoy the hostilities.